into the wee small hours. Lots of activity in Lansing, both inside and outside the chamber. We'll talk about the latest in Lame Duck, plus a big financial boost coming to some Detroit neighborhoods. Today is Sunday, December 16th, 2018. This is Flashpoint. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Jason Carr. Devin is off this week. After taking a hiatus at the end of election season, news from the Mueller investigation is flowing fast once again. A plea deal, sentencing, incessant speculation about what might be coming next. As you might expect, there's been no slowdown in the tweets from the president in this re regard, reacting to what he calls a witch hunt. It was quite a week inside the White House, including an especially testy meeting with Democratic leadership that could lead to a government shutdown as the funding deadline creeps ever closer. But it's not just D.C. on the program. Yep, we have lame duck Lansing to talk about. It did not disappoint for drama again this week. The list of last minute measures grows by the day. Enbridge Line 5 got a signature, but where are the other bills about minimum wage, education, ballot proposals, and so many other issues? Where are they heading? There's groundbreaking breaking news from downtown Detroit, literally as Dan Gilbert begins construction on the Monroe Blocks project, $830 million undertaking that will bring more office space, retail and residential to the area. And some welcome news for seven selected Detroit neighborhoods, which will be splitting $35 million between them. And how far will that money go? and what should the priorities be in those neighborhoods. We will talk about it, but let's start with the week that was in Lansing. That's up first on Flashpoint. We have a tremendous roundtable this morning. Dennis Cowan is the former mayor of Royal Oak, now an attorney practicing with Plunkett and Cooney, to his right, Rochelle Riley is a columnist at the Detroit Free Press. Good morning to you both. Hello. Good morning. Over here on the right side, we've got uh, Jill Alper. She is a political consultant. Good morning to you. Good morning. And finally, in the race to Gordon Gecko hair, I'm only being bested <laughs> by Daniel Howes, uh, the business columnist over at the Detroit News. Thank you for being here. A little more. I've never heard that before. I've got a little more going on back here than you do, but I think you get the gecko thing's a little bit better on your side of the table. Uh, Devin said, as he was walking out the door, put on his aviators, and he tossed me the, the keys to the set, and he said, don't scratch it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, of course not, Mr. Scillian. I'll take very good care of the Flashpoint set while I'm here. Thank you all for being here. Let's get right up the road to Lansing and this lame duck session that's making news around the country, well, around the world, world, as we look at the same thing happening in Wisconsin, same thing happening in North Carolina. Who would like to lead us off on this Lansing lame duck discussion? Well, you're looking at me, so I can tell you that um, we're going to have to find another name for lame duck session, like deadly duck or dangerous duck or um, anything that speaks to how serious it is that you've got legislatures that would try to subvert the will of voters because they want to retain some sense of power. I don't blame people for wanting to retain some sense of power. I have a real problem with people not caring about the sensitivities of voters. Well, let's put, let me put a sharper point on it. I think the whole thing is appalling. Um, you know, it is, Rochelle is exactly right. There's no question that that's what's going on. Uh, they're also, you're also seeing things like taking the chief medical executive of the state and giving her a civil service job just as she's being bound over for trial. I mean, if that isn't a, a, an insult to the people of Flint, to civil servants around Michigan, I don't know what is. Um, and then you pile that on top of some of the legislation that's moving through the legislature. Yet again, the Republicans in the legislature get a chance to take a shot at uh, organized labor in the public sector, and they do it. They got their boot on their neck, and uh, there are other things coming down the pipe, including trying to circumscribe the power of the next governor and next attorney general. Um, I, I think this is going to boomerang on people uh, on, on the Republican Party in 2020. I really do. Uh, in what way? I don't think people forget this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, they uh, they, I, I can tell you right now that uh, organized labor in the public sector is going to be very motivated. They are going to be. They are now coming back into the governor's office, metaphorically speaking, for the first time in eight years. Uh, they're going to be there at the table, and um, yeah, I think this is going to be a real uphill slog for Donald Trump in 2020. 
Yeah, well, I agree with everything you said, and I really appreciated the columns that you've been writing and you saying that, um, what was it, politics used to be the art of persuasion and now it's... Yeah. It's about raw. It's exercise, about raw, raw exercising raw political power, and that's right. what that's right. that's what you're seeing in Wisconsin. You're seeing in Lansing. Right, and even with I th I, look, I think citizens which at large are going to be up, upset about this. Um, there was a, a amazing citizens movement for proposal two and gerrymandering, or to end gerrymandering, mm -hmm. and right now the legislature is trying to circumvent that, take away the power of the Secretary of State. And it, it is unnecessary. The way it works is in that it was in that proposal. It is unconstitutional. This is a constitutional amendment, mm -hmm. and they are trying still at this to have no involvement of the legislature assert themselves. And again, it's unethical because it's being done in the dark of night at the last minute. This is politics 101. Uh, elections have consequences. Uh, we, we've, we've seen it in 2016. Uh, we saw it in 2010 when the red wave swept across the industrial Midwest. They have consequences. And we live in a society where you're supposed to live by those consequences. You're not just sit, sit there and, and meddle uh, on the fringes. And I think that's what you're seeing here. Well, we only get one governor and one legislature at a time. Mm -hmm. And they're going to work to the very end. They're not going to give up uh, what they have. Remember, they've been elected too, and they are a co-equal oh, branch of government. Yeah. Uh, some of the legislation, uh, I think, will not be signed by the governor. So I don't think everybody's hair is on fire right away. Um, I think he's going to look at the things that, if you've watched him over the years, he certainly has been very measured in what I would call some of the more political type legislation. But for instance, on minimum wage, um, that would have been devastating in many uh, small businesses, particularly uh, only, they had an exemption for only in the in initiative for only f uh, businesses with five employees or less would be exempt. That's been risen to 50. I think that's probably a good move. Um, small business uh, is generating a lot of jobs, and I think this would have been very devastating. So I think some of the things that we've seen uh, are good, and, and uh, there's a policy purpose behind it, and then there's some others that are either going to be determined by the courts or the governor's not going to sign it. Don't you think some of this is going to define his legacy, though, when he's looking at this? He, you know, he, he's not running again. He's never going to run for anything again, I would uh, wager. And that he's, I suspect he's going to revert to the, his mean, not the political mean, his mean, where he feels comfortable and that some of these things are not going to get signed like they're getting signed in Wisconsin by Scott Walker, who's on his way out. All right, <laughs> you bring out that situation. Uh, Enbridge, line five, uh, another one, more difficult to get proposals on the ballot, uh, allow Michigan legislature to intervene in lawsuits that challenge the constitutionality of a state law. There's all sorts of things on the table here. Uh, lots of plates spinning on dowels. What do we make of it all? I, I think it's very confusing for voters, but, but with all due respect, I, I don't know that people will want to wait to find out what a governor will do who, as Daniel said, did give a job to somebody who was literally on trial for involuntary manslaughter. That's for like 180 a, grand a year. That's not a lot of trust. Year. But the bigger thing is, if voters said, this is what we need, it doesn't matter if you think, well, we don't think it's a good idea, so we're just going to... That's just like when they tell black voters, we don't want you to have straight ticket voting, as if they have to treat people like they're too dumb to understand what they want. If, if they don't like it, they have an opportunity to try and change the Constitution again, but you cannot say, well, we think you've made a mistake, so we're just going to take your power away from you. Well, remember, the Minimum Wage Act was, or, or initiative, that was never voted on, and there are specific clauses in the law that allows amendments to be made. Now, on the, constitutional, on the constitutional things that were passed, that takes a greater majority, a supermajority, in order to pass any amendments, and I'm not certain they will have all those supermajorities, nor, again, do I think the governor probably is going to sign everything that's been passed. What people need to remember is that they spit on voters to do it, whether they have a supermajority or not. It's the, the voters said, this is what we want, and they're saying we don't care. Right. I think with sick paid and, and these issues, what it's another process question. They were going to go to the ballot, and the legislature said, no, that's fine. We'll pass it. We'll deal with it. And then they got it and lame duck. Mm -hmm. There are going to be 55 percent of the people that in the legislation would have been cared for that will now no longer be cared for. Mm -hmm. And so there is gamesmanship, raw political power being exercised, really at the expense of people. You know, in, in what's happened is with Proposal 2, for instance, I keep going back to it, but I think that gerrymandering has been at the heart of a lot of our problems because legislators don't think there is any consequence for them. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'll just say a quarter of the, ho of the Senate is going to be gone come December and a third of the House. And so there's there. They're, they're getting business done on a lame duck that they should have gotten done before, and the process is being run afoul.
Yeah. Uh, Daniel, 30 seconds or less. No, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, well, we are going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to get in our proverbial uh, flashpoint mobile, drive down 96 away from Lansing, and get into the Detroit neighborhoods and talk a little bit about the money that's being invested in the community. We've been saying for a long time, it's all about the neighborhoods. It can't just be city, center and the suburbs. you got to look at that middle band, so we'll be back after this.